This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. Brother Bailey, you there? Yes. All right, We All Be is on have on Brother Bailey, who is the author of Witnessing Brother Malcolm X, the master teacher, who was a dear friend of Brother Malcolm, worked on his organization, Afro-American Unity, and was close to Brother Malcolm the last year and several months of his life. How are you doing t- today, sir? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm great. And uh, I just want to talk to you because we just celebrate, or not celebrate, but we uh, observe the 51, the 51st anniversary of Brother Malcolm's untimely passing or assassination this past Sunday. And I just want to get your thoughts about, you know, Brother Malcolm 51 years later. And also, you know, I just want to talk about your book as well. Yeah, well, the word that you said, it was a commemoration. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's, you know, February 21st is a commemoration of the assassination. Yes, sir. May 19, his birthday, is when we celebrate. That's right. So I think that's, you know, that's that's uh, true. And, um, well, I think my book tells you exactly what I felt about Brother Malcolm and what he did for me personally. What he, and, that, and that's why I use the term a master teacher. Mm-hmm. Witnessing Brother Malcolm X, the master teacher. Because I think there's no more important members of a community than a master teacher. And and that's what he was. And he taught me, I mean, he, he taught me, you know, in very uh, uh, practical ways, uh, like how to use words. In the very, I was the editor of our newsletter. In the very first issue of the newsletter, I described, I was writing about the killing of that 15-year-old boy by that New York City cop that caused the Harlem uprising in 1964. Mm-hmm. And and Brother Malcolm was over in uh, Africa at the time at the OA Organization of African Unity Conference. So he called back to the office, and was each person had to you know who who was doing something specific had to kind of give him an update. So when it was my turn, I read him what I had written, and I said I witnesses to the murder. And he stopped me. He said, Brother Peter, you can't use the word murder. Murder and murderer are legal terms. You can only use when the person is convicted. And we know this policeman is not going to be convicted. Uh, he said, call him a killer and refer to it as a killing because he's a killer and it's a killing no matter what the circumstances. And, you know, we don't say that, you know, if you, if you call him a murderer, as, call him a murder, refer to him as a murderer, he can sue for defamation of character. Right. And so we had to, he said, so I had to change the thing to killer. I put it in the book, that whole scene, in the, that whole article in the book. And, uh, I changed, I wrote, I, we had already went off about 600 of those things with the old mimeograph machine. So I just scratched out the word murder and wrote killing in there. And uh, sure enough, when, when the, that cop was acquitted, he sued Martin Luther King's organization and Corps mm. for putting out information calling him a murderer. So that was a master teacher, man. He knew the system. We didn't get in trouble because of what we said, because Brother Malcolm told us that if we're having a meeting or a rally, and somebody at our rally or meeting stands up and says, we ought to go bomb the subways. He said, put that person out immediately, because nine times out of ten, that's a plant. Mm. And if that is discussed mm. for 30 seconds, everybody can be picked up and for conspiracy. And even though you have a, they have a very weak case, they can keep the tide of in the course for a couple of years, spending all your time, money, and resources. Wow. So he said, no, you know, nobody who's serious is going to stand up in the meeting talking about going to go bomb the subway. So put, somebody does that, put them out. Wow. Well, those of us involved Brother Malcolm, we never got in trouble for what we said. Because he taught us about that kind of thing. That some, that sometimes the person doing the loudest talking is an, is an, impl- is a, is a, is an informer. Mm. Who's advocating? I saw that recently, Brother. I was watching when they were having those demonstrations about Ghana up in New York, mm-hmm. about the killing of the, of the dude up in New York. Mm hmm. And and the people was you know talking about the killing and chanting and and all of a sudden uh, somebody started saying what do we want dead cops when we want it now mm. now you I'll bet you the amount of money I got that was a plant yes sir that was a plant and all the news that he did was not about the righteousness of the people who were trying to support uh, Ghana. Everything on television that evening was, was was about that person saying that. Mm. What do we want? Dead cops. When do we want it now? I'll bet you anybody that was somebody who was supporting the police. 
wow. started that chant. Well, that's what Brother Malcolm taught us. That's what the master type of thing that the master teacher taught us. Would you also th- say that Brother Malcolm was an old soul? Would you call him an old soul? No, I don't really think so. <laughs> 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 I, just, I just think he was one of those people who, who was a wise enough, and this is what I tell my students. Mm-hmm. He was a he was a listener. He listened, and he sought out people who had information and experiences and things that he could learn from, and then he listened to them, like Dr. John Henry Clark and John Oliver Killens and other brothers, you know, who were older than he was, but who had and people like that. He listened to them, and he learned from them. He had that, you know, great leaders have to be great listeners. Mm. I think that's what he was more than anything else. I mean, and even when we were having our meetings organized in the OAU, some of the people there, like myself, are like we were like, you know, just new young folks, not really, had not had a hard vote. But he, when we said something, uh, he asked us something, and we, he listened to us. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And he was always seeking information. He's the reason I'm a journalist. Mm. Because he made us clearly understand the importance of the gathering and distribution of the information. Wow. Yeah. And speaking of, of, of journalism and whatnot and information, I'm just, I also know, I'm aware today is the uh, 51st anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm's friend, T.O. Pinto, the Kenyan freedom fighter and journalist. Yeah. Who was killed in front of his daughter at a driveway uh, at the age of 38. You know, him like, you know, he planned it with Malcolm, I guess. I, I think that the strategy for the uh, charging the United States with human rights violations against African Americans. Yes. And he was just 38 years old and he was, he had daughters. He had three daughters. Like Malcolm, he was a father, a husband, and he had daughters. So what is your take on that? That was, that was, that was uh, see, you, you under, the only way you, you understand the importance uh, and of what Brother Malcolm was trying to do and 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 work and the people who were working with him, including that brother, was that you have to put it into the. This was the context of the time. This is the so the height of the so-called Cold War. Mm-hmm. And this country was involved in a tremendous ongoing propaganda war with the, with the, with Russia. And mm-hmm. so, and of course the. The Russians were using what was happening in this country racially against the United States in the international arena. So when Brother Malcolm started talking about taking the U.S. government for the U.N. Commission on Human Rights, but being either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of black people, initially I'm sure they probably said, ah, you know, no, you know he's just talking. But as he was moving along, he was beginning to get some movement in this area. I mean, when he went to the OAU conference in 1964 in Cairo, those African heads of state I- issued a resolution condemning discrimination in the United States. That was unheard of. Mm. That's in my book. Yes, sir. And that, that resolution, most people even know they did it. They, it has never happened before or since. And it happened because of what Brother Malcolm did. And in, in the U.N. in 1964, when they're having the debate on the Congo, the U.S. and England and 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 Belgium invading the Congo, and at the UN uh, debates about that, two African diplomats said, "If the United States has the right to intervene in the Congo, who's to say that we don't have the right to intervene and to protect uh, black people who are being killed in Mississippi?" I'm kind of paraphrasing, mm-hmm. but again, that was unheard of for them to make that kind of connection, and it was done because of the groundwork laid by Brother Malcolm. Wow. And I think that's when they said this cat's got to go. Mm. That's something because you know I, it's interesting. I saw the the recent documentary done by CNN last year on Malcolm's assassination. And my thing, uh, the question I have, uh, my thing is this: Could the nation of Islam deny Malcolm X entry into France? No, you will see. That's my position. Mm-hmm. That was the United States government. Okay. Uh, Elijah Muhammad could not call Charles de Gaulle and say, don't let Malcolm X into France. Okay. 
I mean, he wasn't even allowed to go into the airport. Mm. They took him off one plane, drove him out to another plane, and sent him back to England. I met I met the brother who was who was, and that's also the information that's in my book. I met the brother who was part of the group who had invited him to speak, and he told me that they were actually in the airport waiting on him, and and I heard someone say they're not going to let him in, so they ran outside and they saw them when they you know when he got off the plane they took him in, so they went back and called the people in London and told them that he was on his way back to London. Wow. That was, you know, that was a whole, there's no doubt, as far as I'm concerned, there were elements in the nation of Islam who were involved in the assassination of Brother Malcolm. I think they were given the go-ahead by the FBI and the New York City police. If you do it, nothing would happen to you. And I will believe until the day I died that the only reason that was a trial at all was that one of the, one of the actual assassins got shot in the leg uh, running out and got caught. If he had gotten away, there never would have been a trial. Wow. They would have kept saying, we're investigating. So what they did when he got caught, they ran out and picked up two other dudes that quickly threw up in jail and say that they were a part of it, two, two Nation of Islam do, uh, brothers, and come to find out those guys were innocent. They spent 20 some years in jail for, for something they didn't do. The other four people lived out their lives right over there. They, I think uh, uh, one of them, a couple of them, I think, are still alive. Oh, William, they said William Bradley, he was in that uh, commercial for Cory Booker over in Newark. And, and the, yeah. And the FBI and the and the and the they know who who they are, but they were told, you know, hey, you, you, you go. They were they were given a wink. So that was, that was, uh, that was a, you know that was this was kind of like a collaboration between these the the, 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 the feds and and elements. I always say elements in the nation of Islam. Right. But then you look at the fact, or I mean, I guess it's fact. I'm just going to run it by you. The fact that the secretary for Lash Muhammad, John Ali, he was the FBI. Uh, and he was responsible yeah, that's, for correspondence between Malcolm and Eliza. He was Malcolm's that's once good friend. Yeah. I've heard, too, that, yeah, that he, was a, he was an informant. That's what I've heard. And then also the bodyguard for Malcolm Eugene Roberts was the undercover NYPD, right? A part of the boss program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, basically, they say Islam, you could say almost that it was compromised by law enforcement for a while. You had a lot of people that represented what, the FBI, NYPD, or maybe even the CIA inside the nation of Islam. Would that be accurate to say that? I don't know. I think there was some, there, there were some, some key people who were part of that. I don't know for sure. Only one I've heard for absolute certainty was that John Ali was. Okay. But you, you don't need a whole lot of them. Mm-hmm. From what I said, he was the third-ranking man in the nation. Right. At that time. Right. So you don't need a whole lot of people. In fact, a whole lot of them might be a problem. Right, exactly. If you got one key person. You know, it. So uh, I don't think there was any reason for them to have, like, every, you know, all, a whole bunch of just members. Well, I, well I'm sorry, Brother Pete Bailey. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask you this question because I know I talked to Dick Gregory a lot, and he said that they got the autopsy reports. It said that the bullets that were fired into Malcolm came from a down, they came at a downward angle, meaning that they were shot at from a top position, not from the crowd, but at a, you know, from a level, because they said that the CIA actually checked into the Audubon like a week or so before, and that it might have been some other shooters, not the Nation of Islam folks that we think did it. Well, I, all I know is that people that I know saw these three guys mm -hmm. doing the shooting. They said, who, people who were actually eyewitnesses. Right. They said they saw these three guys. Now, I don't know if somebody else was shooting from somewhere else, but there's no way you'll make me believe that these three guys were not shooting. Could they be shooting blanks? I thought they were shooting actual bullets. I don't care what they were shooting. They were part of the deal. Right. They were still part of They were just as guilty they were as people. part people. of the assassination. Yes, sir. If they were shooting blanks or whatever they were shooting, they were part of the assassination. And no one has to convince me that, that, that the, the government was involved in the assassination of the North. I think they did. I personally did it, though. They gave the nation of Islam the go-ahead. Y'all go ahead and do it, and nobody will be punished. Mm. That's what I believe happened. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Y'all go ahead and do it. And, and nobody was punished. It's, and the only reason anything happened was that hair got shot. Because one of the brothers in our organization disobeyed Brother Malcolm and had his pistol on him. Mm hmm And shot Hare and slowed him down when he got caught by the crowd. And then the police took him away. Then they had to do something. So then they ran out and picked up these two Muslim guys. And said, and, and that was it. And everybody in, who was in the eyewitness inside said there were at least five people because two of them started the disturbance and the other three did the shooting. Wow. So, uh... 
No, man. I, no, 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 no. They were, they were, they were, they were there. They were part of it. This was, a, this was a collaboration between the na- elements in the Nation of Islam and the FBI. Mm. And also, and I know, I, and you were seeing the police. I'm glad you brought them up because I know you said in your book you saw two officers that basically wasn't they wasn't they were not responding to what was happening in the ballroom. They, they were they they, I could see them in the office when I first heard the shooting. Mm-hmm. And when I when I when I ran into the main ballroom and jumped on the stage and I saw and then I was walking back after they had taken Brother Malcolm's over to the Columbia Fifth Year Medical Center. I saw these two I mean they were just walking as though they were strolling on a beat in Central Park. Here people were screaming and crying and yelling and chairs yeah. all knocked over. You know, and I saw them. Wow. I know I read yeah. somewhere. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I saw them in that office because Brother Malcolm had sent me in the back in the lobby area to wait and bring to bring someone backstage. So I was sitting there looking toward the door when they come in and in that office which mm-hmm. kinda of off to the off to the uh, left of the entrance. And I know I saw at least two or three policemen in there. Yeah, cause I know I, I I was reading and I saw I talked to Roland Shepard, uh who was uh, he said he was in uniform too. Right. Right. And I, I talked to I talked to some people about this and I talked I talked to Roland Shepard, the white guy, he said he was there. And I saw I read somewhere that they said that Malcolm at his rally would normally be like three dozen NYPD cops stationed around the area, the vicinity. Is that correct? I mean, they were always, you know, up around around the Audubon. Mm-hmm. But I saw these three in the office. I wow. saw them. Mm. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Well, I actually did this as well. Now, I've read this. I want you to, if you could verify it. That you know, they had, after they got uh, Malcolm's body out the Audubon and did their investigation, whatever they called it, that there was actually a dance uh, held in that same space by a black church. Is that, that correct? Same evening, right? From what I understand, it was there was a they because you know that was the place where all major organizations held their parties, their big right. parties. Right. That's what it, that's what it was. The Audubon Ballroom. Hmm. And I was told that they actually had they had a scheduled affair that evening, and it went on. That's crazy. It was black folks, right? These were black people, right? It was a black church, or yes, a... yes, yes. What kind of thinking do I mean? Like, what do you think about that? Like, what type of mindset you got to have to be able to do that? Man, you got to be somebody <laughs> who just you got to be practically a zombie, mm. someone who just don't think. Mm-hmm. How anybody could have gone into a uh, an affair in in the Audubon Ballroom that evening, man, is just beyond my. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it and, and when I first heard it, I didn't hear that until maybe a couple of months later, maybe. Wow. I I just it was about, I was like, come on now, are you serious? Mm. And they finally said, yeah, man, they had, you know, they had whatever affair was was held that evening. That's incredible. You know, I'm, I'm glad you wrote your book because I, you have such great insight. I think it's something that's much needed with all the sensationalism around Malcolm X's legacy, how they're trying to really distort it, that a person like you spoke truth to power with your book. It's such a powerful testimony uh, that you witnessed, you know, in that time period. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that there has been not enough done into looking into the last year and a half of Malcolm's life, which probably was yeah. the most important year of his life. And the things he was doing yeah. in that year – Needs to be amplified today. Continue. Can you talk about that? I wanted. To, that's why in my book I talk about what he was. That stuff he was doing on an international level. Mm-hmm. Because that was what was important, and that's why the U.S. government. Because I heard years later from Dr. Clark that he had gotten six African countries. They had agreed to sponsor such a resolution. Now we all know that the United States government could have told the UN, you know, hey y'all, kiss my royal behind. Right. And go take a long walk off a short pier. Mm-hmm. But it would have, propaganda wise, it would have been devastating. Mm. From a propaganda perspective, it would have been devastating to have to have this brought up before the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. In fact, he, Brother Malcolm had this, was the goal from the very beginning. That's why the, the Organization of Afro American Unity which was the organization that he formed, the secular organization he formed after his, he left the Nation of Islam. 
It was called a human rights organization, not a civil rights organization, because human rights is the international term. Mm. Wow. And, 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 and there, Dr. Clark told me that at least six African nations had agreed, because, you know, it's a, a, UN, a member of the UN would have to bring it up. Brother Malcolm couldn't bring it up himself. He would have to get, a, you know, countries in the UN to bring this subject up. So he had gotten six African countries who would agree to, you know, to bring something up like this. And there were several more that were kind of wavering. Mm -hmm. And for the United States at that time, we, as I said before, it's, it's very important to remember that period in 1955, 1965, was the height of the so-called Cold War. Mm. And this would have been a tremendous uh, propaganda, uh, you know, disaster, a nightmare for the United States government if something like this had come up at the U.N., Wow. wow. Even though the UN could not have made them do anything, but from a propaganda perspective, it would have been a nightmare for the United States government. But you know, the irony of all this is the fact that, you know, 51 years later, the UN did sit, send a research team into America, to cities to, to investigate the conditions of black Americans. And recently they said that black Americans are owed, are owed reparations. So Malcolm planted those seeds from 50 some years ago that still came to bear. That it's on record now he, by the UN was, that they owe us reparations. He 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 understood uh, back then that it was very important that our movement in this society be hooked up with what was going on around the world. He called it the battle against colonialism was the same as the battle against racism. Mm -hmm. And he and and he and he. And he worked hard to convince, and believe me, he had to work to convince African leaders of this. Because you know they didn't want to, you know they didn't want to hear this. Many right. of them didn't. Mm -hmm. And and so the little bit of groundwork that happened because of what he did, you have to. And it was phenomenal. Mm. Those you know that resolution issued by the African leadership and the OAA, OAU. I mean, it's not the most militant resolution in the world, but any resolution at that time, propaganda-wise, was a nightmare for the U.S. You know what is amazing to me, though? And that resolution is in my book. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, I, if you need to read your book, I didn't read this book. It's a, I read your book in one day. He told me to read it and let me know what, you, what I thought about it. And it took me to, like, last week to get some time. I sat down and I read it in one day. I couldn't stop I turning the pages. Go ahead. I wrote it so it could be read like that. Yeah, it, I wrote, it's so important. I, I deliberately, I deliberately kept it. You know, didn't want to make it huge. Mm -hmm. You and made I it plain. Write it in such a way that it would be people could read it, especially young people, because you never know, big thick book. They're not going. They're not. They're going. No, they be scared it. of you. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the cure for everything in that book. You still gonna be afraid to read well, I tried, it. <laughs> I tried to keep it. I tried to keep it in a way that would, you know, that would be, you know, readable, but at the same time would have very, very important information, and some of which. I'm sure that many of the readers are totally unaware of, like it, the UN resolution. Definitely, definitely, because we not it's not repeated in our culture. We're not told about our, the, the, the the true story and struggles of our people. Anyway, they're not teaching this knowledge yeah, itself yeah, yeah. in this in this culture thing. But you definitely are a disciple of Brother Malcolm, the master teacher. You are a master student, and Brother Malcolm was also a master student. As you said, he listened very well to people to oh, take yeah. in the information, oh, yeah. and he studied the information. So my thing is this, is that the fact, like, how you did such a great critique of Spike Lee's movie, uh, Malcolm X. Because I remember several years ago, I saw an interview with Ozzy Davis. And he said that, that uh, he appreciated what Spike Lee done, but he should redo the movie in 20 years from a different perspective. Yeah. And I think what yeah, we well, talked about I, with the last year should be that perspective. What I basically said about the movie is I tell young people, even today, the movie is at best an introduction to Brother Malcolm. Mm -hmm. You cannot see that movie and say you know Malcolm X. Right. You still got to read and listen and see other things. You cannot just see that movie and 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 that movie. See, I was not disappointed in Spike Lee's movie for the simple reason that the movie. I know that Hollywood ain't gonna never do the movie on Malcolm X mm -hmm. that I want to see. Right. So I give Spike credit for what he did get. Mm hmm But he, what he got is just about as good as you're going to get out of Hollywood. 
That's that's what we're gonna see are. a serious Malcolm X movie. We got to do it ourselves. That's what we do, and we got to. Hollywood my, ain't gonna do it. My thing is this: what I, what I love about what y'all did and what Brother Malcolm did over fifty years ago. He was able to influence six heads of African countries and able to influence the politics of the day. He had no no he had no big budget. He had no four foundation grant. He had no George Soros writing a check. He was able to do this because of the grassroots will of the people of you all, you small group of committed people. He had, he had commitment, he had talent, he had wisdom, and he did his homework. Mm. Brother Malcolm used to go in Mr. Michaud's bookstore. And Mr. Masseau told me that he would sometimes just lock him in there. Mm. He would lock up and leave him in there. Wow. He, he did his homework. And that's ready. Because he used to tell us, they will catch me with, because he said, he said, everywhere I speak, I know there are people in the audience whose sole reason for being there is to catch me with my packs roll. Wow. That's the only reason they're there. He said, so what I do is do things in such a way they may disagree with my interpretation of something or my opinion about something, but they will never catch me with my facts wrong. So you basically tell me that Brother Malcolm would have been a beast in this day and age with the Internet and social media. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> <I'm> telling you. <laughs> that would have been something I'm to see. <laughs> but he's still around. We got all his videos, his speeches and whatnot. And people still, I, I talk to people all the time, younger people, right? They love Malcolm X. They say they Malcolmites, but they never heard one entire speech of Malcolm Online, mm -hmm. not message mm -hmm. to the grassroots or nothing. They never heard one into prospect for freedom, not one entire speech by the brother. They, they claim to be followers of Malcolm. Yeah, and students of his history. Well, I think that, uh, and I'm talking to some people about it. We need to plan a a kind of a some kind of conference mm -hmm. where we talk, where you know, where we present the, you know. Malcolm X for serious people. If you're not mm. serious, stay home. I like that. You know, I see. I'm, I, I'm. I've gotten away from this. You know, the grassroots and the masses. Brother Malcolm. <laughs> Brother Malcolm was not. Was not the. Did not romanticize the street life. Right. One of the biggest mistakes that came out of the six. We began to romanticize the street life, and we are paying for that right today. Mm. Brother Malcolm did not romance. He went through it, but he did not romanticize it. He put a great emphasis on, on learning and doing your homework and discipline. And if you don't believe in those things, you can't possibly say you are a supporter of Brother Malcolm. I'm sorry, just because you wear a cap or a thing that, uh -uh, no. You know, you gotta you gotta believe in discipline, using your talent, understand the importance of distribution, gather distribution of information, understand the importance of having a strong sense of self esteem, not mm -hmm. getting becoming see, Brother Malcolm, when you heard him and followed him and listened to him, you know, to me white supremacy is like a toxin. Mm -hmm. But he made you immune to that toxin. Mm -hmm. You know how they can do things make your body immune to certain toxins? Right, right. That's what he was. He made those of us who really listen to him. We are immune to the toxin of white supremacy. Mm. No matter how many different ways it comes, we are immune to it. Oh. But a whole lot of black folks are not, man. They are swallowed. That's crazy. They I mean, I swallowed the basic premises of white supremacy. And you speaking of white supremacy, you know, we just lost uh, Dr. Francis Quest Welfing uh, back in on January 2nd of this year. I had a chance yeah. to interview her a couple years ago. And if you forget that Brother Malcolm diagnosed white supremacy racism before she did. He yeah. actually diagnosed that. You know, because we yeah. see evidence of it now. We can look online and see what he said or quotes or whatever. Yeah. And you was there listening to him and learning from him. But she did, yeah, she did it. She, did, she gave me that kind of scholarly treatment. Okay. Better than anyone else I had ever seen. Mm -hmm. But Brother Malcolm talked about it in the real, you know, in the real practical terms as to what it, you know, what it was and what it was all about. But like I say, to me, I always, I regarded it as a toxin, poison. Mm -hmm. And see, and what, when people ask me, what was it about Malcolm X that first attracted you? And I tell people all the time, it was the fact that he was the first leader I had ever heard in my life. First time I heard him speak, I was 
24 years old. Mm-hmm. And I had never heard anyone who spent as much time talking about the attacks on our minds as they did about the attacks on our bodies. He talked as much about the psychological attacks as he did about the physical attacks. I had never heard that before. Wow. And right now, despite these recent graves of police shootings, we are invo- our biggest thing now, we are involved in psychological warfare and, and are totally unaware of that, most of us. Mm-hmm. How movies, television programs, music, all that, that, that gangster, that, all that stuff is psychological warfare. Mm-hmm. And we we are totally immune. We we are totally unaware of it. Mm. People used to tell me, "Why don't you just go to the movie and enjoy it?" No, I because I know that <laughs> I was told by a brother a brother who taught me propaganda analysis. He taught, and this was our brother. This was the brother I met after Brother Malcolm, mm-hmm. and he said to me, "Man, there ain't no such thing as an innocent movie, innocent television program, innocent book, innocent song lyrics." All of them have a message. It's up to you to find out what the message is. Right. Exactly. That's true. Cause, you know, I, I, I never... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I never... Ne- <coughs> I never forgot that. <coughs> I never forgot that. Yes, sir. I was... Malcolm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Brother Malcolm understood that clearly because he talked consistently and more than anything else, that's what... What what uh he talked about the, the psychological warfare, the con- and the, although the physical manifestations of white supremacy have been reduced and they have been, mm-hmm. but the psychological attacks are unrelenting. Mm. They are unrelenting. Wow. Yeah, I, I definitely every time I turn on my TV now. And I look at the show, they always showing this, uh, you know, Gods of Egypt movie trailer, right? Have you heard about that? About what now? Uh, the Gods of Egypt movie trailer. There's a movie coming out the last, uh, I guess this is the last weekend in February of this year. And it's about the Gods of Egypt. No, I haven't heard about that. Yeah, but the controversy is, is by basically all white cast playing the Gods of Egypt. It's yeah, like a multi million yeah. dollar budget movie. <laughs> And people are over, are out, are people of color are outraged, and I guess the director apologized from, from months ago, but still, I'm, I'm betting it's going to make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, of that we, fact. We, straight out of Compton. Right. Straight out of Compton. Mm-hmm. That's psychological warfare. Because mm. gangster rap music was an attack on the minds of young, young black folks, especially young brothers. Mm-hmm. And there were a whole lot of young dudes who were either dead or in jail today because of of, of, of of being seduced into that whole attitudes and and concepts pushed by that by that uh by those those gangster rapper types. And of course now some of them are living like they're very respectable gentlemen. Mm. And as far as I'm concerned, they're living off blood money. I heard the that. The type of things they were pushing in that stuff. Oh, got a whole lot of young dudes either killed or in jail. Mm-hmm. And straight out of Compton, right out of that. Those, those brothers who were doing using rap, using rap music as a political thing, got completely pushed to the side. Mm-hmm. And the ones who came out there, you know, glorifying uh, street life and glorifying violence and against each other. Because mm. that's where most of it ends up being. And that kind of hedonistic me, myself, and our lifestyle, and and the women of this and that, and the misogynistic things. That's all that stuff. That's psychological warfare, and we went for it, hook, line, and sinker. Too many of our people did. Wow, you know it's interesting. I I I, I contrast with that from fifty something years ago. I saw a Gil no a Gil Noble episode where he interviewed some of Malcolm's you know uh, followers and whatnot. And they talked about how, you know, somebody like Bumpy Johnson saw the value of a Malcolm X and was willing to offer him protection and he turned it down. Yeah, yeah. And he was a big time gangster, right? He was a Harlem Golfer. Well, he knew what he knew what would happen. He knew what would happen if if, if he got connected to Bumpy Johnson, of course they would use it against him. Right. But Bumpy Johnson was sincere, you think? Was he sincere about protecting Malcolm or Yeah, but he Bumpy Johnson I mean he he did the same thing. He was like like the equivalent of the the those Jewish gangsters and Italian gangsters who who did all that stuff and then all of a sudden became very respectable. 
Mm-hmm. And, and and but but many of the many of the many of the Italian and Jewish families in this country today came out of families that were gangsters in the early 1900s. That's true. That's true. That's true. And, and now now they're all professors and doctors and lawyers and everything. Yeah, I went to school with some of them. I went to school with some of them. You go back and do some checking. Right. But you know, you know what Lucky Luciano said? He said, behind every great wealth, there's a great crime. <laughs> hey, you know, he is. That's the tree right there. So uh, let me ask you uh, about this, about the Nat Turner movie that was recently purchased by uh, Fox Searchlight. You think they're going to put that out anytime soon, that movie about Nat Turner that the brother made, Nate Parker? Yeah, they may do it, but they gonna, and the white folks ain't going to make no Nat Turner movie that's going to be legitimate and real. Okay. They may put something out there. Mm. But it's not gonna be like something that's gonna be like like you said, it's the not Malcolm X. The real Nat Turner. Mm. But it got made, but you like you said, gotta, it goes, yeah, go ahead. Stop thinking that they're gonna do we we gotta get they're not going to do it. Now they may put a Nat Turner movie out there. Mm hmm. But it's not gonna be the Nat Turner who he really was. This and we true. just have to. They're not even. They're not even. They're not even going to put out the real Martin Luther King. This is true too. We they're saw that with Selma. Luther, I, <laughs> all they're going to reduce Martin Luther King to is "I have a dream." Right. Anybody who thinks that that was a total Martin Luther King need to read his last book. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? We you know it was, it was and, interesting. Go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, brother Bailey. Go ahead. See the Doctor King. What Doctor King is saying in that book. I have read excerpts from that book to some of my students, and I said, "Who said?" They said, "Malcolm." I said, well, "That's Dr. King talking," and that was his last <laughs> book published there a year before he was assassinated. Wow. Oh, and that's another thing about this: uh, people don't think that Dr. King and, my, and Malcolm was on the same team. I know. I just came back uh, just recently from visiting the home site of Coretta Scott King outside of Marion, Alabama, and it's my understanding that that Malcolm went down to Selma just like you know weeks really before he was assassinated to to speak to the SNCC people at that uh, Brown Chapel. Thursday, right. he met with Coretta. He did. He did. He did. And, and he, he met with Coretta. And Coretta and he, really appreciated him. And he tried to go see Dr. King, but they wouldn't let him to see him. Yeah, but I think Coretta, I mean, she really was, uh, from my understanding, she was she respected him a lot, you know, once she got a chance to meet him and hear him speak. Yeah. He was, he was and, that, and I found out years later that there were people in, in his camp People who supported him, who we we were not, he was, they were not around us. But some, you, people would be surprised sometimes. Some of the well-known black folks who were supporting Brother Malcolm quietly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And there were people from his cabinet from Kingston who were having very quiet meetings with each other, trying to set up a meal, a meeting between these two brothers. And you I don't think they might not never have been buddy buddies, but I think they would have developed a working relationship with each other that would have been dynamite. And yeah, Gahuwa was aware of that. I have a statement in my book that I read in a book by a writer named Anthony Summers, a British writer. Mm -hmm. He did a biography of J. of J. Edgar Hoover. And he quotes J. Edgar Hoover saying in that book when he was having a luncheon meeting with then Senator Lyndon Johnson, quote, we would have no problems if we get those two to fighting each other to kill one another off, end of quote. Those two were Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. Mm. Wow. I have that I have that quote in my book. That's incredible. I know I, I had heard of Albert Simpson, who was the housing director for the SCLC during Dr. King's time. And he said that Dr. King called a meeting back in uh, August of 1966 of his top SCLC lieutenants. And he told them in the room that he was told by a black FBI agent from California that he would be assassinated by the government. This is back in 1966. Yeah. yeah. And we don't... And, Mm -hmm. And in and 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 in, and in 2013, when they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, yes, sir. the Washington Post ran an article on that day, August 28, 2013, in which they say, as a result of Dr. King's uh, March on Washington speech, the FBI launched one of the biggest surveillance operations in its entire history. There you go. Wow. <laughs> and, and now, J. Edgar Hoover wasn't just talking, wasn't doing that because of no, I have a dream. That's right. 
He looked at the rest of Dr. King's speech. That was a tough speech. Yeah, it was. But it has been reduced to I Have a Dream, and I think many of the King people supported it to get that holiday. I mean, yeah, that's the politics, right? You, you know, uh, all people Reagan signed into law, making King a holiday. Get you know, holiday for that. Man, I tell people, read Dr. King's last book written in the first person, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos Our Community. And you will see, get a much clearer idea as to why Dr. King was assassinated. Wow, that's, a, that's incredible. But, you know, once again, it's frustrating, too, because it's like you, you got to repeat this stuff over and over again, and people sit like they still don't get it, or they don't want to get yeah. it. Well, that's because many of our people, have decided to be willfully ignorant. There you go. Mm. Not get information in 2016. You have to say to yourself, I am going to be ignorant. Yes. Because there's too much information out here. So if you're ignorant in 2016, it's because you have basically said, made a conscious decision, I am going to be ignorant. Mm. And I think a whole lot of our people have done that. Definitely, because I know I'm in Memphis, right, and I interviewed folks that normally would be on Dr. King's security detail, because he, when he used to come to Memphis, he would always have an all-black police security detail. But the last time he came to Memphis, he didn't have no protection. And a lot of the police officers were called out. So they let you know already, then the guy who controlled the police and the fire department in Memphis at that time was Frank Holloman. And he used to be Jacob Hooper's number three man in D.C. for 25 years. Yeah. Well, so they let you know what time it is. I've written a play called Malcolm Martin Medgar. Yes, sir. The three of them, the three of them in the hereafter, mm-hmm. talking about things that have happened since their assassinations, mm. and I discussed that in the play. Wow! Oh. It's called Malcolm Martin Medica. I haven't had a full scale production yet, but I have had readings of the play in in New York and Washington and Columbia, South Carolina, Richmond, mm-hmm. Virginia. I've had readings of the play in those places, and people have been very, very enthusiastic about it. But it's called Mar- Malcolm Martin Medgar. We gotta find a way to make that happen to a full scale production. Then here, in, here after they're looking down and commenting on things. Wow, that's that fascinating. Especially what's going on now with us. We need. It's like we lack this type of leadership right now from the black from black leadership, and I mean we lack it really bad because I think about you know I, I was I was looking at uh Mickey Leland about a couple of days ago, just looking at look him up and researching him. And it's really sad that a lot of us don't know about Mickey Leland from Texas who took over Baba Jordan's position in Congress, who tried to actually solve the problem of world hunger. He actually was for real about that. And how they took yeah. him down to Ethiopia, they killed him. They basically killed him in Ethiopia Come on, with a plane crash. They couldn't yeah. find his yeah. body for days, even though they... I mean, you have all the military and people looking for him. They knew where he was at all. They trying to just let him die. But his legacy is not well known among our people. Like People like Alan Payton Powell Jr., his legacy is not really well known. He died on April 4th, 1972, four years yeah, after I King. I know this. I know how how painful it is. I teach as an adjunct professor at the University of District of Columbia, mm-hmm. and I have taught as an adjunct professor. I have taught as an adjunct professor at three other colleges. Yes, sir. Including Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Hunter College in New York, and uh, a Virginia Union University in, in Richmond. I did taught a couple of freshman orientation courses as an adjunct, and I mean it is just painful mm-hmm. to see. That people are not teaching our youngsters history, mm. and 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 giving them some kind of idea as to. In fact, what, I'm planning on doing something. Uh, I'm now the uh, president of the Cedar Lewis Tucker chapter, oh, yes. the State of African American Life and History, and I'm getting ready. We're getting ready to plan something, and I get. I'm getting ready to plan something for my students to do. I'm mm. going to have students in my. I write. I teach a course on feature writing. And an assignment that I'm getting ready to give them is they're going to do an, an article, a feature article as part of their final exam. Mm. Which is going to be is, is way up in, in May, but I'm going to get them started on it now to thinking about it. They're going to do a final exam on black folks 21 and under who were killed or brutalized in the movement. Because, because oh, wow. they, I want them to understand there were people your age who were killed. Mm-hmm. They know vaguely about the four little girls in Birmingham, but that was others. That's so right. they're gonna have to do research. All I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna. They're gonna have to do the research, and they they're gonna have to write a, a feature article on young blacks, 21 and under, who were killed and brutal, or brutal, brutalized, or killed in the civil rights movement. Wow, 
that's the assignment I'm giving my students. That's my brilliant. Feature writing, yes. My feature writing students. And that, that's the article that's going to be a part of their final grade in May. I'm going to, I'm going to probably give it to them uh, it's about the middle of the next month, so they'll have at least. I will give it to them. In fact, I might give it to them at the beginning of March, so they'll have all of March and all of April to work to do the research and work on it. And they'll mm. have to turn it into me before you know when it's time to do the final exams, the first uh, the first week in uh, in May. That's excellent, man. They are, they are blessed to have somebody like you as their teacher. <laughs> that's that's, that's developed critical thinking right there. And that's missing a lot, you know, from what's going on right now. I'm aware because they, they just don't know that there were people that age. Those brothers who started to, to sit in in Greensboro that's right. were, were college students. That's right. Those people who were knocked down with those fire hoses and, and police dogs and everything in Birmingham were young people, sometimes some as young as 10 or 12 years old. Yeah, I'm thinking about Samuel Young down in uh, Tuskegee. In Tuskegee, my hometown. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, yeah, you they're definitely right about real, that. They're going to have to, and I'm just going to give up, you know, they're going to have to do the research themselves. Mm-hmm. But they got the internet, so they could cheat. I ain't saying they're cheating, but, I mean, they got a great, you know, don't give up, advantage. Don't give them too much to do it. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. That sounds great. And I, I want to ask you about this other person. I know you knew, knew him. I believe you knew him, like uh, Leon 4 x Amir. Yeah. I, hey. I mean, I didn't know him. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know him. See, I think it's, I have to make it very clear. I was a part of the OA, Organization of Afro-American Unity. Right. Which was, those, those, that's what those, was, I was not a, uh, uh, I w- and, 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 I, and I try to make this very clear because sometimes it gets confusing. I was not a part of Brother Malcolm's inner circle. Mm-hmm. I really wasn't, and I don't claim to be because I, I hate to see people make claims like that. Right. So too many they make claims like that about Dr. King and Brother Malcolm. I was not a part of his inner circle. I was mm. a strong supporter. I was a founding member of the Organization of Afro American Unity. That's I right. was a I was a, uh, a the editor of the organization's newsletter, and 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 I, and I got to know him, and I was involved with him, and I was some, and sometimes in situations where there were only about five or six people there, you know. But I was not a part of his inner circle, and I was not a part of security and that kind of thing. That was mostly done by brothers who had come with him from the uh, from the Nation of Islam. Who was that? A Muslim Mosque Incorporated? Uh, Leon was? Muslim Mosque Incorporated. That was okay. a religious organization that he founded after leaving the Nation of Islam. So okay. Those people who wanted to follow him from a religious perspective. The OAAU were those of us who wanted to follow him from a secular perspective. And he knew that those there were people like us out there who were not going to become Muslims, but who really wanted to work with him. And, that's, and he was aware of that. Which is why he, you know, he set up the OAAU. I'm glad you clarified that, but I, I was just curious about him because he's not even like Pinto. He's not been mentioned really about what happened in the aftermath yeah. of Malcolm's assassination. Yeah, yeah I, 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 knew, I, I mean, these were brothers that I knew of, but I didn't know them, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't claim to know them. You know, see, how, people have to say that we were only we had less than a year, man. Right. We really had, you know, those of us who got involved with Brother Malcolm, we had less than a year of being of being working with him. I mean, we learned a whole lot in that year, man. If you were really serious, you could learn a whole, and I did. I mean, I tell people, I got my, I literally got the equivalent of, I mean, we learned a whole lot in that year, man. If you were really serious, you could learn a whole, and I did. I mean, I tell people, I got my, I literally got the equivalent of a PhD in about 10 months. Wow. In terms of, of human rights. Uh, uh, race race relations, mm-hmm. psychological uh, warfare. That's right. You know, but you know the, the fact. Yeah, you know, I believe you because I also I would say this: even though you was not a part of his inner circle, his wife thought enough of you to make you a Paul bear. That's not how he thought of you. You know, the fact yeah. that his wife would actually See, make and, you a Paul bear. Because I didn't know. I had I I had only met her, uh, you know, a couple of times. Mm-hmm. But she she told later when I asked her why, <clears throat> she said because he was very impressed with what I did with the newsletter, and he talked about me to her. He called me that college boy because I had that real kind of 
Joe College. <laughs> Yeah, I see the picture with you on the phone. And, uh, and he was very pissed when I did this newsletter, and he told me mm-hmm. that's why she did it. But basically, you he he thought enough of you. You were close enough to his inner circle for him to, for her to do that. So I mean, he thought about you and talked to you, talked about you with his wife. But he had a lot of respect for you. That, 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 to me, that would mean a lot to have that type of respect from somebody like Malcolm X. Oh yeah, what it does. They can take me a long way, man. <laughs> Yeah, that type of respect. Yeah, from somebody like him, it's amazing. It does. It has tremendous. But, but I still don't want to, you know, act like, oh yeah, he, I was one of the, you know, one of his, uh huh, you know, close advice, that kind of stuff. You know, I really wasn't. But you've been listening to him. You've been listening to him, like you know, in Harlem since 1962, correct? Since 62, yeah. All right. Everybody so you've been knowing about him for three years. And the first time I heard him speak, everywhere he spoke in in the, in the New York metropolitan area, I was there. So basically, you did the opposite of Gil Noble, and I commend Gil Noble for doing the stuff he did after Malcolm died and being honest about it. Yeah, what well, Gil told me, when Gil told yeah. me, he said, you know, he said, I'm going to confess, man. I yeah. was scared to get anywhere near him mm. when, you know, when he was alive. Gil told me that. Right. He was honest about it. He was honest about it. But it's like he spent the rest of his life trying to make up for it, though, with his media work and acting. He really did. He did some incredible mm. stuff. Yeah, I, I oh, thank you for the stuff with the Malcolm incredible. stuff, yeah. Yeah. He did some incredible stuff. Mm. Wow, yeah. man, that's amazing. Listen, no, I, I got a, yes, sir. I gotta got uh, get off. Yes, sir. Now, could you could 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 you send me a copy of this? Yeah, I go to see your copy. There, there'll be no problem. Okay. Okay. I could I could email you. Want me to email it to you or send it in the mail? Uh, and also I have it online. I can see your link too, as well, too. Okay, yeah, but I still want a hard copy too. Yes, sir. I get send it, me uh, a link and send me a and and, and 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 I guess you can email it. You know, but I can get it printed off. Yeah, so yeah, you get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah it'd be like yeah, an audio you file. You can do it like that. You can do it. Okay, like what's that. your email address? A Peter mm-hmm. B. Yes, sir. A Peter B. At Verizon dot net. All right, got it. Okay, I got it. A Peter B at Verizon dot net. And anyone wanted a copy of the book, that's also where they can contact me because you have to order the book directly from me. It's not in any stores or Amazon, anything like that. It has to be ordered directly from me. And I definitely would say that people need to get a copy of this book, and I'll definitely make sure on my end that I promote it as such. I just want to thank you, brother Billy, once again. A Peter B at Verizon dot net. Yes, I want to thank you once again. The words are great to get and we love you madly and keep on producing and pushing. Okay, thanks, sir. Thanks, yes, sir. Take care. You get better.